Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to listen. This week, as most of you know, Clay Jenkinson is on the road. He's been on the road for several weeks in Montana doing his annual Lewis and Clark tours. And I would be remiss if I didn't say if you are interested, go to jeffersonhour.com. You can find out all about those tours, upcoming tours, and his online courses. And you can also support the show there, which we very much appreciate. But due to the fact that he is not here this week, we are rebroadcasting a show from September of 2017 called Peaceful Transition, uh, which I think is very appropriate and, and timely, and we hope you enjoy it. We'll be back next week with another new show, a conversation with Lindsay Chervinsky about Thomas Paine. But now, this week, from September of 2017, Peaceful Transition. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author and creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and seated across from me, I'm pleased to say, is President Thomas Jefferson. Good day to you, sir. Good day to you, my dear citizen. And how are you on this fine day, sir? I am fine, sir. Well, that's excellent. I'm I'm glad to hear it. I, I know health is always an issue during your time. Well, health was so precarious during my time. We didn't have any of the medical systems that you take for granted. Uh, we barely understood the circulation of the blood. There were no transplants of any sort. Uh, I remember when, when Nabby, Abigail Adams' daughter, had breast cancer, and she had an operation, a mastectomy, uh, to cut out the the cancerous tissue, and she had that without anesthetic of any sort. She was she was held down, and a knife or scalpel was used to cut into her breast. That is such an unpleasant image, sir. Just to give you a sense of the barbarism of the medicine of our time, there are accounts in Aubrey's lives. Aubrey was a contemporary of, of Milton and John Donne and Shakespeare. He says that people who had a toothache and had a tooth extracted occasionally went insane because there was no painkiller. When we look at the letters you write uh, and the greetings you used, uh, you often would bring up good health. This was a serious matter. And the first thing that you did in a letter to anyone who had been absent from you for more than a few weeks was to ask, if, in a certain sense, if they were still alive. You didn't put it in quite that language, but you wanted to be assured that they were alive and in something like good health. But if you had strep throat, as George Washington did, you could die. Uh, my daughter, Lucy, died of whooping cough and an ear infection. Uh, no antibiotics. Um, leeches sometimes, bleeding, purging. Uh, the medicine was was really unimproved. Maybe, maybe it had been degraded from the time of the ancient Greeks. And so we lived just on the other side of the great medical breakthroughs that you all now take for granted and which have doubled the longevity of the American people. In my time, if you got through your first seven years, you might get to 70. But at any point, and this happened to my sister Jane when she was 24 and to my closest friend Dabney Carr when he was 34, a uh, sudden fever or a sudden infection could could kill you or on the Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, the only man they lost of their own company was a sergeant from one of the nine young men from Kentucky, a man named Charles Floyd, a very young man. He died of what they called bilious colic. Nobody quite knows what it was, but he was he was well one day and dead the next. Mr. President, we've received a request from a listener. Uh, Emily Knight has asked if you would talk to us about the peaceful transition of power in American history. You were involved in that peaceful transition of power, and who better to talk about it than you, sir? Possibly the greatest moment in American history was when George Washington, our commander-in-chief, having successfully defeated the British to win the War of National Independence, resigned his commission. He literally returned his commission to the Second Continental Congress, thanked them for the respect and honor they had shown him, and quietly returned to Mount Vernon to pursue his private life. That 
nobody could have expected that. Most revolutions end with the establishment of a, of a dictatorship. That's how the French Revolution ended with Napoleon Bonaparte, who rose through the ranks to become the, the master military leader of France and then assumed complete power for himself. All revolutions, if you go back to Julius Caesar, when Caesar had won the Gallic Wars, the wars against France, he didn't dare come back to Rome because if he did, he wouldn't be able to bring his army. And if he came back without his army and resigned his commission as a proconsul of France, then he would be vulnerable to prosecution and mob violence and so on. And so the, if there had been a way to guarantee that he would not be prosecuted and that he would be allowed to live out his life as a wealthy a veteran of those wars and a great writer and an important statesman, he probably would not have crossed the Rubicon and initiated the, the civil wars that led to the end of the Roman Republic. But the Romans had not devised a method for someone of Caesar's capacity to retire peacefully. He knew that if he retired without bringing his army into Rome, that his life would be endangered and probably over within a few months. And so he destroyed the Roman Republic because they had not developed a system for peaceful transfer of power. I'm not suggesting that Caesar was a virtuous man. He was not. And there were many things for which perhaps he deserved to be prosecuted. Nevertheless, if he had had immunity, there probably would not have been a collapse of the Roman Republic. Bringing it back to our time, Mr. President, there's a very famous painting that uh, is on display in the rotunda of the United States Capitol by John Trumbull, General George Washington resigning his commission. That's it. Uh, the painting depicts that scene on December 23rd, 1783. Now, do you know, sir, uh, how much artistic license Mr. Trumbull took? Is, is, does his image of this represent anything like the truth? I wasn't there, so I can't speak definitively, but I can tell you that Trumbull was a friend of mine and he stayed with me at my salon in, in Paris for a time when he was in Europe working on these very paintings. And I, I was a kind of advisor to those paintings and a consultant. And he did one on the Declaration of Independence, which also is prominently displayed in, in Washington City in the District of Columbia in your time. And I know that the painting he created had a kind of heroic, epic quality to it that didn't really square with the known facts. It didn't trouble me because, of course, that was a heroic moment in the history of our experimental republic, but I'm depicted in it and others are depicted in it. It doesn't actually have what you would call a photographic realism for the moment, uh, which it intends to depict, but this is the nature of, 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 of such painting. If you look at the traditions of the time, Jacques-Louis David, the great French painter, painted the death of Socrates and the oath of the Horatii and, and many other things. And, and he, he was not attempting at what's known as verisimilitude. He was attempting to get at the essence of those great moments, but with considerable artistic license and, and Trumbull uh, did the same. However, those reports that we have of Washington resigning his commission are extremely moving. Uh, there wasn't a dry eye there. Uh, Washington himself was was uh, overcome with emotion. And when George III, the tyrant of England, heard this story, when he heard that George Washington in the New World had had supreme power and had defeated the world's most important military establishment, that is Britain, in the War of American National Independence, and then at the very end of that had resigned his commission quietly and returned to be a simple farmer at Mount Vernon, George III said, if that's true, he's the greatest man in the world. And that is true, that George Washington's virtue saved us from what otherwise would have probably been the same fate that happened to France in the, in the wake of Napoleon's dictatorship. And I think that is so important for Americans to understand today. And certainly I feel that way, that how significant this action was for establishing civilian authority over the military and which is really a fundamental principle of our democracy. Indeed it is. And we put into our constitution, thanks to the extraordinary leadership of my closest friend, James Madison, uh, a provision saying that the civilian shall always be dominant over the military authority, that civilians will determine the policy of war and peace and the movement of troops and the engagement of troops 
uh, in the United States and that all funding bills and all bills involving war must begin in the people's chamber, the House of Representatives. So those lessons from ancient history, Rome, I gave you one story from Rome, but, but, but they proliferate. Those lessons were not lost on us. We were deeply educated people. Uh, the founding fathers knew their classics, knew their Polybius and their Tacitus and their Livy and their Thucydides and their Herodotus, but particularly they knew their Plutarch. And the lessons of the ancient world were known to us, and we, we incorporated their insights about government and about human character into our own system under the Constitution and the Articles of Confederation and the Bill of Rights. It's described by modern scholars James McGregor Burns and Susan Dunn as, quote, the Virginian, like the victorious Roman soldier Cincinnatus, went home to plow. Yeah, Cincinnatus is, is uh, depicted in a number of, of ancient Roman books, but particularly uh, the, the biographical sketches of, of Plutarch, which were, by the way, written in Greek. Every one of the founding fathers knew these, at least in English. Dryden, uh, the British poet of the 17th century, had a famous translation of Plutarch, and before that, others. And we all knew this, and, and those of us who could read these uh, lives of parallel but certainly, Mr. Washington could have kept his commission, could have gone on to become president or king or whatever he wanted. He wanted to be the American Cincinnatus and retire. We wouldn't let him, and so he was called out of retirement to preside over the Constitutional Convention in 1787 against his better judgment. In fact, he felt that it might destroy his reputation. And then when the Constitution was completed, it was inevitable that he would be the first president of the United States, but he did not want that role. And then he wound up having to serve not one, but two terms against his better judgment. And he felt that that his historical reputation was in tatters from all of this. Luckily, that's not true. But he did set a precedent by serving only two terms. Which I then set in concrete by retiring after my two terms. I would certainly have been reelected to a third and a fourth term, but I felt that uh, it was important uh, not only to honor our, our first American, uh, George Washington, by um, following in that tradition. But also, I felt that we needed that precedent to be set in concrete so that later presidents wouldn't want a third or a fifth term, or, or for that matter, to try to serve for life. Well, poor Mr. Adams didn't have that option for a second term. And we're going to take a short break, Mr. Jefferson. When we come back, I, w I would like to talk about the transitions between Washington and Adams, between Mr. Adams and yourself, between yourself and Mr. Madison, if you'd be willing to discuss that. Of course, sir. I had the good fortune to live through that entire period. We all, I think, knew that John Adams would follow Washington to become the second president of the United States. What we didn't know is that Adams would serve only a single term and that that would bring about the first actual transition from one party of men to another in the course of American history. And those moments are fraught with danger and the possibility of constitutional collapse. And that's what I'd like to speak to you about, Mr. Jefferson. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. And we're speaking with Mr. Jefferson this week at the request of a listener, Emily Knight, about the peaceful transition of power in the United States, how unique it is, and getting your firsthand account of, of, of these transitions, Mr. Jefferson. Indeed, I was the third president of the United States. I never wanted to be the president of the United States, but when I was elected in 1800, I did call it the Second American Revolution. Of course, the word revolution is a potent word in this context, but it meant that power was being transferred from the Federalists, led by Washington and Hamilton and John Adams and others, to the Republicans, the John, James Madison, James Monroe, myself and others. And that transfer of power was not just from one administration to the next, but it was a significant and fundamentally different way of seeing how power should be used in our society. And so there was enormous anxiety across the political spectrum in every state and at all levels of our social structure about what it meant when one group of people who had, who had ruled for 12 full years were discredited and retired and another group of people who had not 
been in the center of the ruling establishment, suddenly took control of the ship of state. You talked earlier about George III's reaction to George Washington resigning his commission. I would suspect that the whole world had some sort of an idea of what had happened, that and the presidential transitions. Was there a world reaction? Not world reaction so much. I mean, there would the, the people of France and Britain would have been watching this to a certain degree because they had a material interest in this. If, if I were elected in 1800, we would be moving away from our attachment to Britain and towards a greater affinity with France. And if Adams had been reelected in 1800, he would have pursued his pro-British policy. So those, those two nations, which were involved in a world's uh, global struggle, were deeply interested in this. But for the most part, this was, a, this was a domestic matter. Well, let's talk about the transition from George Washington to John Adams. I, I've not found a lot of historical information about that. What can you share, sir? It was a continuity. You know, in a certain sense, you could say that Adams was Washington's third term. He called himself in a letter to his wife, Abigail, the heir apparent, as if being vice president uh, meant that it was now his turn and that it was inevitable that he should become the second president of the United States. So it was a smooth transition, but the following term, when you became president in 1800, not so smooth. There were two things about my election in 1800. One is that Adams had expected to be reelected. He, he assumed that he would be permitted to serve at least two terms and maybe more, that the president should serve as long as it suited him or as long as his health was good and that the people would show gratitude and, and continue him in office unless he had done something impeachable. And so he was offended and, and deeply hurt by the fact that the people retired him after a single term. So that was the first thing that was uh, significant about that. And the second thing is that it was a transfer of power from one party of men called the Federalists to another party of men called the Republicans. And everyone got it that this wasn't as it is in your time when one administration of one party lasts for four, eight, or 16 years, and then the other party takes command. This was seen as almost cataclysmic because it was a vote of no confidence for the Federalists, the men who had set up the government, and there was widespread anxiety about what my party represented, if anything. And there was, I must say, deep concern about me that, that, that honest and well-meaning people in New England especially wondered whether I was too radical uh, something of a Jacobin, uh, Frenchified in my personal tastes, if if I intended to destroy the uh, fiscal system that Mr. Hamilton had built and repudiate the national debt or turn everybody out of office or, for that matter, abolish Christianity or who knows what, abolish private property. I was seen as, as a radical. The term that you would use in your time is a communist or a Marxist or a Leninist or something, but a, a wide number of of honest men had deep concerns about what it was that they thought I represented. They did not know me really, but that that was what they felt. It, it was a dicey election, to say the least. Now, I'm not sure all Americans understand how it worked back then, but there were ballots taken in Congress. But because because we tied. Right. There were 36 ballots, according to what I've, I've read, uh, trying to resolve this tied electoral vote. That's right. I defeated John Adams. I was the presidential candidate. Uh, of the Republicans, and he was the presidential candidate of the Federalists, and I defeated him. There was no question about that. But I tied in the Electoral College with my vice president, Aaron Burr. The Constitution saw a tie, and it didn't care whether we were of the same party or not. It, it said, Mr. Jefferson, that you leaked information that uh, middle states would arm and, uh, and there would be a convention called to reorganize the government. Is that is that accurate? Uh, not quite, but, but, but I certainly don't utterly repudiate that. What happened was that the Federalists tried to steal the election by having a flirtation with Aaron Burr, my vice president, and he, to his e eternal discredit, flirted back. And they were, they were contemplating a junta where the whole country knew that I had defeated John Adams and that I was the presidential candidate. But because of this electoral tie, the Federalists thought they could forestall my election by finding some accommodation with Colonel Burr. And Burr was an opportunist and a man of, of really no character. And so he then contemplated participating in this junta. So when that happened, when we when we realized that 
the Federalists were so desperate that they were actually willing to to break the Constitution and steal the election. That's a bit ironic. They were the ones who were so in favor of it. Indeed it is, but this is the truth. You know, Hamilton in New York actually wrote to Governor Jay and said, let's void the election and start over. We, we can't let Jefferson win. And John Jay, the governor, said, wait a minute. There has to be due process. There has to be stability in our system. We can't be – We you know, this is maybe Hamilton's lowest – single moment. But at any rate, when this all happened and, and we were heading towards this impasse, 36 ballots, ballot after ballot after ballot in the, on the floor of the House of Representatives and the, the tie could not be broken, James Monroe was the governor of Virginia and he began to make contingency plans to mass troops at the border of the District of Columbia and if necessary, invade the district and take back the government on my behalf. I did not want that to happen. Nobody wanted that to happen. That's civil war. That's the end of our republic. But that's how that's how high the passions were running at that point. My understanding is, is the threat of that happening was really what made the Federalists back down. Even they realized there was no long-term profit in this. Of course, and they also had to understand that they were they were really violating the will of the people in, in an essential way. And Hamilton came to my rescue. Now, strangely enough, Hamilton disliked me profoundly. Uh, I, I doubt that he hated anyone more than he hated Perhaps me. Perhaps Aaron Burr. Well, we were we were maybe in a tie there too, but but Hamilton decided that I was the lesser of the two evils, and he wrote a famous letter saying, you know, Jefferson is unscrupulous, and Jefferson has no great commitment to the truth, and Jefferson is a Machiavell, and Jefferson is an intellectual voluptuary, and Jefferson uh, is too Frenchified in his in his politics and too earnest about democracy, and on and on and on. He said, but compared to Burr. He's outstanding. We have to vote for Jefferson because he has. Pre- he says he has pretensions to character, and he will not be a, a mere opportunist in the way that Aaron Burr is. And so that letter had an effect and helped the diehard Federalists give up finally and allow the duly elected person to be installed uh, on March fourth, eighteen o one. But after thirty six agonizing ballots in the House of Representatives, so this was a very deeply contested election and. There was no question of my legitimacy once I became president, but this is not the kind of uh, smooth transfer of power that you are really looking for. And let me add one more note to this. When my inauguration finally came on the 4th of March, 1801, in, in the new federal capital, John Adams, the outgoing president, for reasons best known to himself, uh, snubbed me and did not attend my inauguration. He left on the dawn stage for Baltimore and then on to Massachusetts. And in doing so, he really committed a very dangerous act. We need the continuity of power, the peaceful transfer, the respect of the outgoing to the incoming uh, people in power. There needs to be a sense that, that our differences may be important, but once the campaign is over and the electors have made their will known, that we have to come back together in, in something like national consensus in unity. And by by wandering out of town on the dawn stage. I'm scratching my head here. Uh, so Hamilton went against his own party and said, vote for the other party because the candidate from my party is so far out and unacceptable. And then the gentleman from your party didn't really, or opposed to you, didn't really want to concede. That sounds pretty familiar to me. Well, just one correction to that, the candidate of the Federalists was John Adams. Right. And Hamilton had written a nasty anti-Adams So there was, there was some cross-party stuff right. going on. Right. So, then, yeah. so then the two Republicans, Burr and myself, were left with a tie, 73 votes each in the Electoral College. And we were both of the Republican stamp. But Hamilton decided that Burr was, was really a scoundrel and therefore I was to be preferred. I must compliment you, Mr. President, on one precedent that I believe you set, and that is your conciliatory remarks to Congress in your first address. Well, I felt strongly that we needed to come together, that the election was over and it was in the past and we shouldn't dwell there, that the less of those energies of bitterness and rancor and resentment and mutual recrimination that we carried over into the next administration, the better for all of us, not just politically, but for the the health of our fragile republic. 
What you did, Mr. Jefferson, was say, I want to serve all the people, or am I romanticizing that too much? No, I said every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. We have called by different names men of the same principle. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists, and I meant it. Did you give credence to the Federalists? Did you reach out and meet with them? Did you address their concerns? Of course, and I kept their office holders in their in their jobs for the most part. So for the first 12 years under our Constitution, every appointment had been a Federalist. And Washington had appointed Federalists. Adams had appointed Federalists. No Republicans. And so when I came to power, my my violent partisans wanted me to clear everybody out and start over and put in only people of our own political stamp. I refused. I said, no, that we can't go on if that's going to be the style. I'm going to keep as many Federalists as I can. But they have to be willing to work with us. If they are diehards who are holding offices in the Treasury Department or in the State Department or whatever it might be, and they are sworn enemies of my administration and they are going to work to undermine its success, then, of course, I have to remove them. And But I wanted to use attrition, death or retirement, wherever possible. But I would remove Federalist diehards if necessary. But anyone who was moderate and was willing to cooperate in some meaningful sense of the term with my administration was allowed to stay. And then, of course, my partisans cried foul. They said, what are elections about if you don't clear out all the scoundrels and put in us? Instead, I refused to do that. Uh, this was a very vexed issue. I called it appointments and disappointments. But I, I refused to have a wholesale witch hunt against the Federalist bureaucrats because that would lead to a permanent cycle of one party punishing its predecessor and then its successor punishing it and so on. I had not heard that from you before, Mr. President, appointments and disappointments, a clever turn of phrase. I said for every person I appoint, I get one ungrateful person and 10 angry people. So this is really one of the hardest things that any president has to do, appointments and disappointments. But I did it, and in the end, I wound up replacing a fair amount of the Federalist bureaucracy, but I refused any wholesale pogroms. I congratulate you on that attitude, sir, and I wish it was a precedent that every president since your time had taken, that of after the election reconciliation. Some presidents do, some do not. Let's go to the end of your two terms, Mr. President, when uh, Mr. Madison became president. I felt even when I became president at the age of 57, just under 58, that I might be too old for so um, difficult an office. But I served my two terms. I, I really wanted a second term by the time I, I took it because I felt I had to vindicate my administration against the calumnies and the attacks and the innuendo and the false distortions that had been put forward by the partisan Federalist press. So I was reelected in 18 resoundingly. I think I only lost two states. And then I served that second term. But by the time I finished, by the time that the summer of, of 18-8 came around, I was exhausted, worn out by the French Revolution and the embargo crisis. I knew that Madison would be the next president. I hand chose him. It was clear that he would win. Uh, there was a slight contest between him and James Monroe, but I was able to, to resolve that. And then Madison was clearly going to be elected. In a sense, he would be my third and fourth term if you want to look at it in that way. And during the last six or seven months of my administration, I actually essentially abdicated. I let Madison make as many decisions as possible. He was my best friend and trusted secretary of state. And I did not want to tie his hands. You know, Adams had made his midnight appointments of, of high Federalists, sworn enemies of my administration, sworn enemies of me personally, including Chief Justice John Marshall. And I always resented that. And I did not want to do anything to make it difficult for my successor to run the country as president in the way that he saw fit. And so I was I probably went too far in that regard because I was spiritually and physically exhausted. But I certainly erred on the other side from the way John Adams tried to prevent the second American Revolution by packing the courts with high Federalists. Well, thankfully, you and Mr. Adams in 1812 began to correspond again, and and uh, you, you patched up your differences. Indeed, uh, that came about in 1812, long after I had left my second term as president. We had always loved and admired each other, and we were able to overcome the 
the disagreements that had really been a wedge between us uh, for a period between about 1796 and 1812. And then we had a great friendship in our last years. When one reads the history of the transition of power from you, Mr. Jefferson, to Mr. Madison, it's pretty apparent that you were not after accolades. You were not after personal notice. Uh, you wanted to keep a low profile and let it be Madison's moment. It's said that you rode your own horse unaccompanied to Mr. Madison's inauguration. In fact, people were shocked that you took care of your own horse and tied it to the post and, and that you would not even be seated at the front table near Mr. Madison. I was Cincinnatus of another sort. I wasn't a famous warrior, uh, as, as everyone knows, but I believed that no president is particularly important, with the possible exception of George Washington, our first. I believe that we mustn't create a cult of the presidency. I wanted people to know that I was the first citizen, but I wasn't dictator or monarch or lord or aristocrat, that I was a farmer scientist from Virginia. I tried to dress in plain gentleman's clothes. I rode my own horse during uh, and after my presidency. I, I don't like the, the pomposity and the ceremonials and the, uh, the, the sort of cult of monarchy that is always tempting for people in power to surround themselves with pageantry and with gorgeous ritual and liveried servants and so on. And so I wanted to, to remind people that I was a, a Virginian who was a plantation owner and a scientist who had come to be president for a time, had served as diffidently and as hesitatingly and as humbly as I could. And now that I was being released into my private happiness, I wanted to do so as a private citizen. Mr. Jefferson, in summing up, how important is this? Uh, do you think the republic could survive a, uh, a transition of power if it wasn't peaceful? I think it Perhaps can survive, but it's a very dangerous thing. I think it's the transitions are more important than the pomp and circumstance, frankly. I think that, that it's very important that we all understand that the power belongs to the people, not to any individuals or any party, uh, that it all derives from the sovereignty of the people, and that we need continuity, harmony, mutual respect, mutual trust, mutual forbearance, and above all, a sense that the Republic is more important than any human being whatsoever. And if we don't um, ritualize that in these transitions, we could be moving towards a more chaotic and maybe even collapsed constitutional system. Thank you very much, Mr. Jefferson. You are most welcome, sir. We're going to take a short break. When we return, we'll be joined by the gentleman portraying President Jefferson, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. We are now joined by the gentleman who portrays President Jefferson when he's here, the creator of The Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. And before we begin speaking with you, Mr. Jenkinson, I would like to thank Emily Knight once more for suggesting this as a topic of conversation, the, uh, the peaceful transition of power. I got the letter, as you did, and I was impressed by it, and I thank Emily for sending it to us. I know This is really interesting because, first of all, I think that what Margaret Bayard Smith said, you know, in this Our Happy Republic, I have seen the peaceful transfer of power, and in most countries this is an epoch of confusion and chaos and so on. That's the best thing ever said about this subject, and... It reminds us how important that transition was in uh, March of 18 between the Federalist administrations of Adams and Washington and the coming Republican administrations of Jefferson and Madison and Monroe. So I'm glad she wrote that. And then I, I spent some time, as I know you did, really studying this. And there isn't enough written about this. You know, that most countries do have chaos, assassination, madness, military juntas, dictatorships, et cetera. We've been lucky. Britain has been lucky. The United States has been lucky. Sweden has been lucky. But but through most of history, the transitions have been violent and really disruptive to anything like uh, economic or political stability. You brought up Margaret Baird Smith's uh, description, that letter, which I agree is— uh, It's a fabulous letter. Uh, we're so grateful that she would write about these things, but— 
the one that I found that I had not read was her account of Madison's inauguration, which is really pretty much about Jefferson. Madison asked Jefferson to ride in his carriage. He declined. He refused. And he rode amongst the people, the citizens, quote, unattended even by a servant, undistinguished in any way from his fellow citizens. But others said that Jefferson looked happy and Madison looked grim and grave and anxious. And Jefferson, <laughs> well, some things never change, right? Yeah. Jefferson was now released. You know, he's the one who said, never has a prisoner released from his chains melt felt more relief than I do upon this occasion. I have no more desire to govern men than to ride my horse through a storm. So he's going back to Monticello. He's had a successful two terms. He's still beloved. He still has some life in him, unlike George Washington, who went back to Mount Vernon in 1797 and was dead two years later. Jefferson has another 17 years ahead of him, and he's happy. And Madison, who deserves to be the fourth president, of course, is now suddenly feeling the the tremendous weight of the presidency on any rational human being. Let me share just a little bit more of Margaret Bailey yes, Smith's please, account please. of Mad Madison's inauguration and ball. Arrived at the Capitol, he dismounted and he hitched his own horse to a post and followed the multitude into the Hall of Representatives. Here a seat had prepared for him near that of the new president. This he declined. And when urged by the committee of arrangement, he replied, quote, this day I return to the people and my proper seat is among them. That's so great. Jefferson had a wonderful sense of political theater. He goes on, surely this was carrying democracy too far, but it was d not done, as his opponents said, from a mere desire of popularity. He must have known human nature too well not to know that the people delighted to see this. It, what no, a guy. It's, what it's, a guy. It's fabulous. And it, it was political theater, but it was also an understanding of the nature of a, a republic. So Jefferson believed that anyone could be president, that it wasn't that different from jury duty, that you shouldn't take it too seriously, that the legislative branch is the most important one, that we don't need a lot of government, that people are probably able to govern themselves with very little formal apparatus at county, state, or national levels, that the purpose of a nation is peace and prosperity and agriculture and education, and that he, Jefferson, was now being released from this somewhat disagreeable eight-year period of his life to go home, and he wanted to remind people that we are not going to go down a monarchical path. I, my daughter and I have been watching the, the uh, British television series, The Crown, about oh, Elizabeth. Wonder, it's, it's wonderful. It's fabulous. Yeah. But you see the pomp and the circumstance and the pageantry and the and the valets and the gorgeous soldiers and the, the carriages and the horses drawing them and so on. But Jefferson said, no, not here. We are not going down that path. He knew his popularity. He knew his place. And just like Washington doing the Cincinnatus, giving up his commission, Jefferson was was setting a precedent for the future of the country. He was saying, you know, I'm a regular guy. I give him a lot of credit for that. I really do. I love him the more for this. He meant it. You know, this wasn't just saying, oh, here my advisors have, have convinced me that I should walk to my inauguration and that I should refuse to go to the ball that Mr. Madison had on the night of his inaugural. Jefferson had this exquisite sense of what a republic, what a people's democracy would actually look like. And he wanted every action of his uh, to conform to that and to set precedents that people would have a hard time violating later. And if he could wake up today and see what the pageantry is now, where an airport like the Los Angeles International Airport can be disrupted for, for six or seven hours when a president passes through, he might understand why this has become inevitable, David, but he would still lament that this has happened. And the last president who behaved in a Jeffersonian fashion in this way was Jimmy Carter. He carried his own luggage. He wore sweaters in the White House. He uh, refused all the, the pomp and circumstance, and he was, he was blamed for it. I mean, he, he was severely criticized for underplaying the pageantry of the modern presidency when he was just trying in his own way to go back to something of the humility and simplicity that he saw in people like Thomas Jefferson. Emily Knight, in her letter, writes uh, reasoning for having this conversation with, with Mr. Jefferson. Uh, she says, quote, how critical it is to our stability, including candidates accepting when they've lost. 
I think it was especially important in the beginning when our government was new and vulnerable. But I think, myself speaking, I think it's equally important now. And I, I understand the reasoning behind uh, people asking this question because it just doesn't work that way anymore. It's- Everything that she wrote is 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 right as far as I'm concerned. You know, I think that we have lost something essential, and I think we we must get it back. I don't know how you return from this kind of level of deep, deep mistrust, but we must. I how, do. how do we get it back? It's one man. It's one candidate. You know, that's the thing about. I remember I've, I've said this before when I when I was young and the Vietnam War was going on and all this awful stuff, and I would talk politics with my father and say, "How come it takes so long?" And he would go. That's the way democracy works. That's the way it's the safest. But I also believe that the right leader, uh, the right woman, the right man, the right candidate can reverse all this in, a, in an administration or less. You know, as, as the year 2017 ended, uh, the Congress was trying to decide whether to pass a, a tax bill. And I heard someone on a on a talk show, on an NPR, saying to a, a Republican congressman, why not give this some time because it only has 26% approval by the people of the United States and most people don't know what's in it. Wouldn't you want the people to support whatever you do? And don't you think that they should have time to really e- evaluate this? And if the people are against it, don't you think you should go back to the drawing board and produce something that has at least 50 or 60 percent approval by the American people. And the congressman said, no, no, they'll, they'll see the, how great this is once they get it. And I thought, this is really bad news. And this, this has nothing to do with the Republicans. It could be the Democrats. But, but how did it come about that we now think that the, the people's will, when only 26 percent supported this tax bill or only 23 percent supported the repeal of Obamacare, that the Congress, as the people's representatives have the right to thwart what is clearly the discontentment of the people and say, it's spinach. You'll love it. Just wait. We'll show you. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's crazy, David, that we've reached this point. And we, we must return to some sense that the people are sovereign and that you must keep them with you and that you must build as broad a consensus as you possibly can. And that anything that's shoved through by one party and Obamacare was shoved through by the Democrats. Now this tax bill is being shoved through by the Republicans. It goes back and forth and back and forth. You cannot govern this country this way in the long run. Maybe we need that individual who will be so charismatic and so wise and so inspiring that that person will be able to overcome some of this. We thought, many people thought that Obama was going to be that person. He thought so, surely. That didn't work out. It's hard to see where this, where this comes from for me, David. And for me as well, Mr. Jenkinson. And I suspect it would be for Mr. Jefferson as well. Jefferson would be weeping over all this. But I do agree with you that leadership counts. And, of course, that puts the current president in a pretty grim light if you're talking about unifying the country, binding together the nation's wounds, seeking consensus, um, ratcheting down the temperature and ratcheting down the rhetoric and the hate who knows what really is going on here, but it, let's just say it's a highly unusual plan to unify the country. Well, we're having this conversation in September of 2017, and sir, who knows what the future will bring. I thank you and Mr. Jefferson for this week's conversation, but now it is time for this week's Jefferson Watch. We take peaceful transfer of power for granted. Along with Great Britain, Sweden, and a handful of other countries, we have a long, unbroken tradition of transferring authority without violence from one party of individuals to another. Margaret Bayard Smith's statement on March 4, 181, has never been improved on. She wrote, I have this morning witnessed one of the most interesting scenes a free people can ever witness. The change of administrations, which in every government and in every age have most generally been epochs of confusion, villainy, and bloodshed in this our happy country, take place without any species of distraction or disorder. If you Google peaceful transfer of power, you immediately get dozens of sites that discuss the election of 1800, regarded as the first time in American history that power was transferred from the incumbents to a decidedly differently-minded opposition. 
The fact that John Adams did not make things any easier for Jefferson by not sticking around long enough to attend his inauguration is usually ignored, but it was a very serious breach of republicanism, not to mention friendship. Remember that in Jefferson's lifetime, power in France was transferred from the King's Party to the Radical Republicans in a profoundly unpeaceful way. Their method was not the ballot box, but rather riots, the guillotine, the reign of terror, and the beheading of the sovereign, King Louis XVI. No one could call the France of January 21, 1793, this our happy country. 150 years before that, Power was transferred in England from the monarchy to the parliamentarians on January 30, 1649, by a way of removing the head of King Charles I from his shoulders. We've been lucky. We're on our 45th president, and there has not been a fundamental succession crisis. Well, one, if you count the southern secession following the election of the 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. That conflict was not settled until much of the South was turned into a wasteland, and approximately 800,000 Americans paid what Lincoln called the last full measure of devotion. The transfer of power from John Quincy Adams to Andrew Jackson in 1829 was not perfectly serene. Jackson's partisans flooded the federal capital and essentially sacked the White House. In Miami, Florida, an assassin tried to kill Franklin Delano Roosevelt on February 15, 1933, a few weeks before he took the oath of office. Four of our 45 presidents have been killed with bullets, Lincoln, 1865, Garfield, 1881, McKinley, 1901, and John F. Kennedy, November 22, 1963. Virtually the first thing Hitler did when he came to power in 1933 was to cancel future elections. The same was true of Mussolini a decade earlier in Italy. More recently, Egypt's ancient president Mubarak had to be shouldered off the stage Roman dictator Nikolai Kosciuszko and his wife Elena were executed by firing squad on Christmas Day 1989, a few weeks after the Berlin Wall came down. Saddam Hussein was hanged on December 30, 2006, and just a few weeks ago, Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe was turned out of office by the Nationalist Army. Relinquishing power is a profound and difficult thing. Theodore Roosevelt found that he could not be happy observing others, Taft, then Wilson, wield power that had once been his. He was perhaps the unhappiest former president in American history. The temptation is to think you and you alone can administer things right. When after 9-11, New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani announced that he was willing to stay on after his term expired, December 31, 2001, I experienced an actual catch in my throat. No, this is not how our system works. Fortunately, cooler heads prevailed and Giuliani retired on schedule. The right-wing knuckleheads kept repeating that President Obama was planning to declare martial law and hang on to the presidency in 2017 until they worked themselves into a lather and greatly increased ammunition sales yet again, but Mr. Obama left office as graciously as any president in our history. My concern is that, to use Margaret Bayard Smith's terms, this, our republic, is no longer very happy. The last three presidents have all been damaged by what might be called legitimacy crises. In 2000, George W. Bush was installed as the 43rd president in a strictly partisan vote by the U.S. Supreme Court. His election was problematic. It may have been stolen. Although Barack Obama won the election of 2008 by a solid and uncontestable margin, he had to endure eight years of obscene legitimacy challenges by the right-wing conservatives and the racists, sometimes the same people. It would be hard to exaggerate how dangerous and irresponsible it was for Donald Trump and millions of others to pretend that Mr. Obama was not an American citizen and to insinuate that he was a jihadist crypto-Muslim bent on destroying constitutional norms in the United States. You would think that making such wild, unsubstantiated, and reckless claims would preclude its principal cheerleader from being a serious candidate for the presidency. But voila! President Trump's legitimacy crisis, as we all know, is a self-inflicted wound. His immediate family members and his campaign team clearly had flirtations with Russian operatives designed to undermine the candidacy of Hillary Clinton. This cannot be called opposition research. It's a federal crime. It's, in fact, treason. Just how far this story will take us towards a whopping constitutional impeachment crisis in the next 18 months is unclear. My guess is that Mr. Trump probably survives, 
but the apparent collusion and the clear obstruction of justice, coupled with the fact that Mrs. Clinton won the popular vote, means that the legitimacy of Donald Trump's presidency is in some question. We cannot go on like this, my fellow citizens. We have to restore some kind of stability to our electoral process. We have to come out of this profound partisan funk and return to some minimal respect and goodwill so that we can really say after an election, the people have spoken, and we all look forward to working with the president or congressman or governor or senator to address the problems and opportunities of the most significant nation on earth. When Roy Moore refused to concede the special senatorial election in Alabama in December, I felt that same catch in my throat. When you begin to delegitimize elections and their winners, you are on the path to chaos. One greatness of America has been its political stability. We are now moving in a perilous direction. We want this, our happy republic, back. I'm Clay Jenkinson. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public Radio. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any past show for a $12 donation, please call 888-828-2853. Again, that number is 888 888- 828-2853. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.org and on iTunes. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.org. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at McCoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Music by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson.